Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our second uh, session during the COVID-19 horse industry webinar series offered by eExtension Horses. Um, my name is Jenny Ivey. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee here in Knoxville. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to offer this um, both with Dr. Christiana Martinson and Laura Kenny, who will introduce themselves in a moment. Um, but just wanted to kick off today by letting you know that the Q&A section um, is open below um, that you can submit your questions throughout the session. We'll moderate them accordingly and then we'll ask them um, to our presenter, Dr. Joe Lyman, um, at the end of his presentation. And so we're really excited to be able to offer this through the efforts of Extension Horses, uh, which is a group of extension professionals and industry members across the country that come together to help to deliver science information um, to those within their state and across the country. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Martinson and let her introduce herself. All right, thank you, Dr. Ivey. Um, my name is Krishana Martinson and I'm the Equine Extension Specialist at the University of Minnesota. And before I introduce uh, Dr. Lyman, I thought that we would allow Laura Kenny to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Laura Kenny. I'm an equine extension educator with Penn State Extension. So today I'm gonna be helping with the question and answer portion. So if this is your first time on Zoom, um, I want you to wiggle your mouse over the main screen and you should see a toolbar pop up on the bottom. So among the options available to you on that toolbar, you'll see a, a small box that says Q&A. So if you have a question throughout the course of this presentation, just type it into the Q&A box and we will be sorting those to make sure that the most frequently asked questions do get answered. We may not be able to answer every single question, but we'll make sure that the general uh, concepts get covered. All right, thanks a lot. All right, so to get to our webinar today, we feel very fortunate to have Dr. Lyman, who is an equine veterinarian. He currently is with Neogen and has been there since 2014. Um, previously, he practiced equine medicine in the Lexington, Kentucky area. In addition to his practice, he is an adjunct professor at Midway College and has been an invited speaker around the country on topics ranging from equine reproduction to farm biosecurity. He currently serves as Neogen's Director of Research and Professional Services and takes an active role in product development, service, and support. And obviously with the current situation we are in, we knew that he was a perfect person to talk about horse biosecurity and also give more detailed information on facility sanitation. Um, Dr. Ivy and um, Laura, do we have some questions we're gonna start out with, some poll questions? Yes, absolutely. And so I'll launch this poll. There's a series of five questions, if you don't mind to take those for us, we'd be really appreciative if you could help to provide some insight as to what's going on for you and also locally within your area. So the first question you should be able to see here, what sector of the industry are you representing? Um, the second question is going to ask, um, how has facilities where you're keeping your horses um, responded to COVID-19? Um, whether you found the webinar useful, which you can uh, weigh in on later on, and how you will also use the references and resources um, that were shared today. And then if anyone else needs access um, that couldn't join, to the webinar today. So those will all be live throughout the course of um, today's webinar. And Krishana, if you have anything else to share, um, if not, I think we can probably turn it over to Dr. Lyman. All right, and um, Dr. Ivy, just to be clear, these questions will remain open until the end of the presentation? Yes, that's correct. All right, thank you very much. All right, Dr. Lyman, we're turning it over to you. All right, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you all today. Um, 
I have tried actually not to make this a terribly specific COVID presentation. I'm sure there will be lots of questions about COVID uh, that we can address at the end. Uh, this is really meant to serve as an overview of how we approach biosecurity uh, for each individual facility and some general measures that we can take to protect a facility and keep uh, all the horses and people on the facility healthy. So when we talk about biosecurity, it drums up all sorts of images of uh, government officials and hazmat suits, but really biosecurity is just the entire set of all the measures that we employ to reduce the impact of infectious disease. Uh, and, and note that definition says reduce impact. It doesn't mean that you're ever going to reduce infectious disease down to zero. Uh, that's not the goal of most biosecurity programs. Um, but we want to make sure that we limit the spread and we limit the severity of cases when we do see them. Um, but biosecurity, it, it's not a 100% sort of activity. We're, we're not trying to keep horses in bubbles. We're not trying to uh, institute such drastic measures that we can't enjoy the horses uh, or have them serve their function or continue on in our business practices. So as we look at biosecurity measures, we have to find the appropriate biosecurity measures for our facility that still allow us to perform the functions that we're trying to perform. So it's very easy to come up with biosecurity practices that are so cumbersome that we aren't able to actually do anything useful with, uh, with the horses we have. So it's always going to be a balancing act between looking at the risks, looking at the severity of certain outcomes, and then trying to decide where we want to institute appropriate measures. One of the points I'm frequently trying to make, though, is that biosecurity in, in the horse world in particular usually becomes very uh, interesting topic, I guess, when people read about an outbreak. So of course, right now, COVID uh, is all the news and everybody's life is impacted by it. So suddenly there's lots of interest in COVID. Uh, and so we have biosecurity talks all the time now and uh, biosecurity on the news and all of the uh, individual biosecurity steps we can be taking. Uh, and we see the same thing in the horse world when we read about a, an outbreak of EHV, herpes virus, uh, that results in a quarantine. And so everybody rushes then to institute biosecurity measures. But then after a time, they think, well, you know, I haven't heard about this in a while, or well, nothing happened here, so we'll just go back to the way we were doing it before. And really, if you want biosecurity to be effective, you have to protect yourself all the time. So you want to be practicing biosecurity at a consistent level all the time. And then in response to an outbreak, you may institute additional measures, but you should never go back to the zero measures or you should never go back to the, uh, the complete uh, default position that you were in before. You should always try to uh, be assessing risk and making sure you're responding appropriately. So when we talk about disease, it's important to think about two things. Um, it, it, disease only occurs in an animal when you have exposure to the pathogen. So the pathogen is that uh, microbe that is causing disease, uh, usually a bacteria or a virus, occasionally some fungal organisms that can cause uh, diseases. But those pathogens have to get into a susceptible host before they can cause disease. And so, well, when we talk about biosecurity, we're almost always talking about the exposure to the pathogen part of this equation. It's important to remember that the susceptible host has to be there to uh, actually generate disease. And we want to make sure that we're maintaining as healthy a population of horses as possible. Uh, so staying current on vaccinations, not ignoring little signs of disease like coughs or runny noses uh, in our populations, and making sure that we keep a generally healthy group of animals is as important for biosecurity as limiting the exposure to pathogens. So now we'll kind of get into the meat of biosecurity. Um, I divide biosecurity up into three components and we talk about bio-exclusion, bio-management, and bio-containment. Uh, 
Uh, Bioexclusion is basically everything we do to keep disease off our facility. Uh, biomanagement is everything we do about disease that is on our facility. And then biocontainment is one that people very rarely think about, but it's how do we make sure disease doesn't leave our facility? Uh, and as we look at biosecurity plans and what we can do on our specific facilities, we need to make sure that all of our measures are thought about for each of these goals, keeping disease out, managing disease that's on the facility, and then keeping disease from leaving the facility. So some examples of bio-exclusion. Uh, bio-exclusion is actually something that in uh, livestock industry is very aggressively uh, practiced. And in the equine world, it's just now starting to come up. We see lots of bio-exclusion bio uh, measures being implemented by facilities now in response to COVID. Um, and this is kind of the area where you think about uh, a good defense being the best offense, right? Everything you can do that keeps pathogens from entering your facility means you don't have to deal with measures for that pathogen on your facility. Uh, in terms of practical management, uh, one of the easiest things you can do is, of course, maintain a closed herd. Now, that's obviously not available to everybody, uh, but keeping other animals from entering into your population means that you don't have to deal with the risk of an unknown health status animal coming in and potentially exposing your animals to additional disease. Um, obviously, that's not uh, an option for every type of facility. Uh, event facilities aren't ever going to maintain a closed herd. Uh, and certain boarding facilities or show facilities, that's not really an option either. Uh, but you can think about bio-exclusion then in limited fashion, where you say, I'm going to practice bio-exclusion in my aisle at the show, or I'm going to practice bio-exclusion for this barn, uh, because this barn is going to have only the resident horses that never leave the facility, uh, and, and have a specific zone of control, and practice bio-exclusion related to that. Uh, visitor control is one that is getting a lot of discussion right now. It's very easy. Uh, you simply make sure that you aren't allowing visitors in that pose a risk to your horses. Um, now that COVID is all the news, we're also looking at visitor control into facilities, not just as risk to horses, but as risk to ourselves and to our staff. So visitor control right now uh, is examining whether or not those visitors are uh, potential risk factors. So you wanna make sure your visitors haven't traveled in the last 14 days, haven't shown any signs of uh, illness, uh, tight chest, cough, those sorts of things in the last four day, 14 days, haven't been exposed to anybody who has tested positive, um, haven't been exposed to anybody who's showing signs of illness. These are all questions you can ask before allowing them to visit your facility. Uh, and if you do have to have visitors, which of course conduct of normal horse business means we're going to have uh, professionals who need to visit uh, veterinarians, farriers, um, uh, you can't completely eliminate visitors, uh, but you can make sure that they are taking appropriate steps on arrival to the facility to make sure that uh, they aren't bringing any disease in with them. Uh, health records are a very common form of uh, bio-exclusion measure, verifying the health status of an animal before it's allowed to entry into the facility. Uh, animal screening and quarantine, uh, same idea there with health records so with the screening, make sure that they're healthy animals, uh, but you're actually doing some form of health check at arrival at the facility. So uh, taking a temperature, doing an inspection of the animal before it's unloaded. Um, give you some measure of protection. And then quarantine, it's not available to everybody. Uh, it's rapidly turning into a dirty word as we're uh, all sitting at home for uh, weeks on end here. But um, quarantine can be employed even in a single barn facility by isolating animals to a specific end uh, and not allowing them sort of general access to your facility or, or not allowing turnout into the same paddocks as the, the other resident animals. Uh, wildlife barriers can be difficult to enact in um, rural settings, but it is something to think about. 
Uh, I used to work on a farm where every day that we would uh, uh, go out to feed the horses, we would also see the skunks and raccoons come out to share in the feed with the horses out in the paddocks. So uh, you do need to be aware that wildlife is a uh, potential source of disease in your facilities and make sure that you're trying to limit the contact with uh, your herd with wildlife. Uh, and then insect and rodent control done on a perimeter basis is a measure that we would call bioexclusion. When you do those same things within your facility, we would call those bio uh, management measures, but uh, those are also vital to prevent the entry of pathogens. Uh, water treatment is something that's not done very extensively in the horse world, but we do see it a lot in other livestock species uh, to prevent entry of pathogens through water sources. Uh, and then, of course, vaccination for diseases to prevent the, your herd from developing those. And then entry hygiene. This is a big one that is really easy to employ, and most people aren't employing it fully yet. Uh, entry hygiene is simply insisting that somebody wash their hands or sanitize their hands on entry to the facility, and also inclusion of a foot bath. Uh, there's actually been a lot of information out there recently in the news about COVID uh, being spread by people walking. Uh, there was one report where they showed that 100% uh, of samples in hospital pharmacies were testing positive for COVID. Um, those are hospitals that were treating active COVID patients. Uh, and the, the point of that was that the, the floors in those pharmacies aren't walked on by sick people. They're walked on by the professionals who are actually treating them. So um, it is possible to spread disease simply by walking from place to place in the facility. So you want to make sure that you have a foot bath with a disinfectant in it at the entry area to your facility uh, to make sure that pathogens aren't introduced as people come in. Biomanagement is what most people really think about when they when we talk about biosecurity uh, and environmental cleaning and disinfection is the number one. Uh, when I talk about biosecurity, most people really just want to know uh, what should I disinfect with? How often should I use it? Uh, and, and that is an important part of biosecurity, but all of the biosecurity behaviors have to be employed to make sure that environmental cleaning and disinfection is actually successful. So uh, think of that as a vital part of biosecurity, but don't think about that as everything you're going to do for biosecurity. Uh, included in biomanagement, we're also going to have environmental surveillance, which would be looking around your facility to be able to identify reservoirs of disease. Uh, this can be really important for veterinary hospitals or boarding facilities that see uh, potentially sick or at-risk animals frequently. Um, not every facility needs to be performing environmental surveillance for pathogens. Uh, vaccination for diseases that you are already dealing with in a herd, of course, becomes a biomanagement tool. Segregation of sick animals. Again, not every farm has the luxury of multiple barns or multiple paddocks, uh, but you can try to isolate animals to specific areas of the facility. And then make sure that you have uh, operations in place that uh, separates out the sick zone from the healthy zone. So you do everything in the healthy zone first, and then you go to the sick zone and manage those animals. Uh, you don't travel back and forth from the sick animal to healthy animal. You don't take tools back and forth from sick animals to healthy animals. Uh, you certainly don't share tack. Uh, you make sure you aren't dipping your water hose into the bucket uh, when you're actually delivering water. Ideally, you would have a completely separate hose for the, the sick end of the barn. Uh, treatment of sick animals is another biomanagement tool. Uh, that one sounds obvious, but uh, in my experience in the horse world, we accept a certain amount of illness as if it's just normal. Uh, and, and we see an awful lot of snotty noses and an awful lot of coughs. Uh, um, you know, I, I worked on a breeding farm primarily. We had uh, yearlings and we were always dealing with some low level of disease and it just kind of became a, uh, something that you thought, well, we just always see disease and it's okay. Uh, but actually treating those animals limits how much more pathogen they're spreading back into the environment. And you can actually 
reduce the severity of disease and the incidence of disease by more aggressively treating what you would normally think of as a minor illness. Uh, immunostimulation is another tool you can use. There are some uh, immunostimulant products out there in the market that are kind of nonspecific uh, uh, generators of an immune response. So you can turn up the overall herd immunity uh, in the face of disease. Um, diagnostics, so you can actually identify what disease you're trying to fight. Again, that sounds obvious, but very often we resort to treatment without really worrying about the diagnostics. Uh, and then again, water treatment to make sure that uh, our water supply within a facility is not part of the spread of pathogens. And then biocontainment. Remember I said this is the one that most people just don't really think about, uh, and it, it should be vitally important for us. Uh, it should be something that we think about all the time. Uh, and biocontainment is making sure that we're not taking disease from our facility and bringing it elsewhere. And, and I think the most important one to think about is bringing it home. Um, there are zoonotic diseases in the horse world that we deal with. Uh, zoonotic meaning that it can go from a horse into a person. Um, and because of the presence of those sorts of pathogens, we want to make sure that we aren't bringing them home with us. Uh, and so upon exiting your facility, you should make sure that you're employing some form of hand hygiene. Uh, hand washing would be my preference for this one over hand sanitization. Uh, hand sanitization we know according to the CDC guidelines is as good as hand washing only when hands are not uh, soiled or contaminated. And I think it's a reasonable bet that if you've been working around the horse farm, there's a decent chance you have uh, soiled or contaminated your hands. So hand washing at exit, uh, again, use of a foot bath at exit from the facility not just at entry, uh, and then having a change of clothes and having a change of footwear. I, I always advocate that people have dedicated footwear that is only for the barn. Um, ideally, it doesn't even go back into your vehicle when you leave, uh, but certainly not uh, entry into your house. So uh, think about biocontainment as the thing you can do to make sure that the community at large stays healthy uh, and the steps that you're doing to make sure that your, uh, your family and loved ones at home are staying healthy as well. So when we start looking at biosecurity principles, uh, one of the things you want to think about is zones of control. And I kind of mentioned this a little bit when I talked about bioexclusion at the beginning. Uh, and zones are simply areas that have different known health statuses. Uh, one area of risk versus a separate area of risk. And anytime you go from one level of risk to another, that's a biosecurity event. And if you start thinking about biosecurity plans in terms of biosecurity events, uh, it becomes a little easier to understand where you should be instituting some form of biosecurity measure. So just like I talked about uh, biocontainment and doing some measures as you leave the farm and go to your house, uh, that is a, uh, a transition from one zone of risk in the barn to a separate zone of risk, hopefully lower risk uh, in your home. And so by going from one zone to another, you've uh, enacted a biosecurity event and you need to enact biosecurity measures. And just like I talked about uh, washing hands and uh, use of a foot bath would be good examples of biosecurity measures you can employ for that biosecurity event. But you should think about this as it relates to uh, different size zones. So your facility as a whole is one control zone and the rest of the world is the other zone. So any sort of transition from your facility as a whole to the outside world is a biosecurity event and you need to examine are there appropriate biosecurity measures that need to be taken. But then within your facility, you can also think about these. Um, if you have a sick area, uh, designated or sick horses within the barn, then you have a sick zone and a healthy zone. So you even have zones of control within your facility. And you can even think about dividing it up further than that. If you have a boarding facility that has a 
a, a waiting room or a viewing room, that would be a separate zone of control from the aisle itself. And you might in, think about employing different uh, biosecurity measures between those zones, even as something as simple as having a, a hand sanitizer at the door that would give you some control between those uh, two zones. To accomplish all of this, it's really important to designate a biosecurity officer for your facility. Uh, the biosecurity officer doesn't necessarily need to be uh, a veterinarian or something like that. And in fact, it should really be somebody who sees your facility all the time and is accessible all the time. Uh, I, I do think having a good relationship with a veterinarian and making sure your veterinarian is involved in the biosecurity planning for your facility is important. But the officer is the person who sees it all the time and is able to recognize when something isn't being done according to plan, uh, when there's been some sort of biosecurity break and then can reach out to the professionals to understand how to work back through the implications of that biosecurity break. Uh, this is the person who uh, you want to tell when you saw somebody going uh, from the sick aisle into the healthy aisle or something like that. Um, so the biosecurity officer is somebody that should be designated. Everybody in the facility should know who it is, uh, and they should be the ones who are responsible for looking at the biosecurity decisions, making sure they have a plan in place, making sure that the plan is executed, and making sure that everybody is actually trained. Um, so I did tell you we would get to cleaners and disinfectants. Um, you'll notice I keep saying cleaners and disinfectants. And the reason is whenever we talk about disinfection, we talk about cleaning along with it. Uh, you should never be just spraying disinfectant onto a facility without cleaning it first. And that's because the vast majority of disinfectants are inactivated by the presence of organic matter. Uh, disinfectants have to come into contact with the pathogens to actually have their effect. So we have to clean surfaces first and then disinfect. So we'll always talk about that as two steps, cleaning and disinfection. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is there are a lot of cleaners in the market that are very good cleaners, uh, but they make some claims that make them sound as if they are uh, disinfectants. They'll say things like aids in the reduction of equine herpes virus. Um, those aren't disinfectants and you need to make sure that you're only using them as cleaners and that you're employing a disinfection step after application of those products. Um, a disinfectant will always have an EPA registration number on the label and it will usually include some specific pathogens that it has been tested against as examples of the sorts of things that will be effective in disinfecting. Um, so always make sure that you have a registration number on your disinfectant, otherwise it's just a cleaner, uh, but it is, as a cleaner, still an important biosecurity tool. Uh, in general, it's kind of a dogmatic view. There's no great science behind this, but we always talk about cleaners do about 90% of the removal of pathogens. So simply by cleaning your surface, you're enacting a good biosecurity step that does hopefully reduce the pathogen load in your environment. Um, but really our goal there is reduction of the organic matter to make sure that disinfectants have their best chance to um, uh, come into contact with the pathogens and render them uh, uh, inactive. So uh, you should be aware there are a number of different chemistries out there for cleaners. There are alkaline or, or basic, neutral or acidic cleaners, and they all have various uh, uses. Neutral cleaners are just sort of the jack of all trades. They're good, they're non-corrosive generally. Um, Alkaline cleaners do a little bit better in the presence of biological soil, so they make relatively good cleaners in uh, farm environments. And acidic cleaners are really good at removal of uh, straight soil and uh, minerals. So if you have particularly hard water where you see a lot of scaling on uh, sinks and surfaces, acidic cleaners can do well in those environments. Uh, no matter which cleaner you're doing though, make sure that you have a good rinse step between the cleaning and the disinfection part. Uh, and the reason for that is based on those chemistries, uh, if you have something that's an acidic cleaner and you apply a um, 
a disinfectant that works in a more alkaline environment directly on top of it, you'll have decreased uh, efficacy from that disinfectant. So you want to make sure you have a good rinse step after your cleaner uh, before you actually apply your disinfectant. So uh, at some point, we're going to have to decide which disinfectant we're going to use on a facility. And there are a number of considerations that come into play here. Uh, and, and I've listed out just a couple. This is by no means a comprehensive list of all of the traits of disinfectants. Uh, but in general, we think about the cost, the ease of use, the surface compatibility, the safety, and the effectiveness of a product. Um, and the point that I want to make here before I talk a little bit about different disinfectants is you want to make sure you select the disinfectant that you're going to use every time it's appropriate to use it. Uh, and that, again, sounds sort of obvious, but it's one that we often uh, neglect to think about. Um, so bleach is a good example. Bleach is a low cost uh, and it is generally effective. Um, bleach is usually mixed incorrectly by people who are uh, applying it. Uh, bleach works at either a 1 to 10 or 1 to 30 dilution depending on which sort of pathogen you're targeting. But um, most people mix bleach to the point that it is much too concentrated. So uh, they get a nasty smell with it. It becomes a little difficult to apply. It can be irritating to people in uh, poorly ventilated areas. And it begins to erode surfaces or damage fabrics. Uh, and as a result of those traits, people don't use it as often as they should, right? They know that every time they disinfect, they're going to uh, destroy a piece of metal or damage their halter or something like that. So they don't disinfect with it. And as a result, um, even though it's a perfectly decent disinfectant, uh, the lack of use renders it ineffective. Uh, so other chemistries that are available out there, uh, quaternary ammonium compounds are very common. Uh, they're usually just called quats. Uh, you'll recognize them on a label uh, by a, um, the end of the active ingredient usually says ammonium chloride. Um, quats are uh, generally good disinfectants for most uh, pathogens that we see. Uh, there are some pathogens, small non-enveloped viruses that can be a little difficult for them to uh, have effectiveness against, but they're generally good. Um, they are also generally low cost, easy to use, largely safe. Uh, they have much better surface compatibility to uh, than something like bleach would have. So they meet most of the characteristics that would allow us to use quats on a frequent basis, uh, whereas bleach might not be the one that we want to reach for. Um, when you combine quats with an aldehyde, um, uh, is a product that the engine manufacturers called Companion, uh, that is a quat uh, aldehyde or glutaraldehyde combination. Uh, you get even better effectiveness against some of those small non-enveloped viruses than you would get with uh, just a quat on its own, uh, while retaining a lot of those surface compatibility and, and low-cost traits. Uh, phenolics are also very common in the equine environment. Uh, phenolics are good for use in foot baths uh, in particular because they tend to perform better in the presence of organic matter and foot baths almost always become contaminated. Um, so we can look for phenolics. Uh, Biofene is, or Biofene 2 is the neogen uh, phenolic that's out there. So, um, when you're looking at disinfectants, though, like I said, the important part is to just go through and make sure that all of the characteristics of that disinfectant uh, are suitable for application by you in your facility uh, on a consistent enough basis that it's uh, not going to limit the effectiveness of your biosecurity program. Uh, if you're ever in a position of deciding I'm not going to apply disinfectant because I don't like to, or it takes too long, or it costs too much, or I'm worried about it damaging my surfaces, uh, then you haven't picked the right disinfectant for your facility. Uh, another point, though, if you read the label on a disinfectant, it will always say uh, suitable for use on hard, non-porous surfaces. 
uh, non-porous means there are no gaps in that surface that will allow for um, penetration or uh, uh, a lack of contact by the uh, disinfectant. So pores in wood or concrete floors uh, or certainly dirt will allow for the pathogens to hide and not actually come into contact with the disinfectant. Uh, the problem with hard non-porous surface statements is we just don't see a lot of hard non-porous surfaces in the equine environment. Uh, very few equine facilities have been built with the uh, idea of biosecurity and disinfection in mind. Um, you can uh, make wood less porous by making sure that it is routinely sealed. Uh, routinely means every one to two years. Uh, most facilities aren't doing any sort of sealing that frequently. Uh, the same with concrete. Dirt floors, you pretty much can't make a non-porous surface. Uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be using disinfection on those surfaces, it just means that you expect reduced performance of the disinfectant on those surfaces, and you have to consider those as potential reservoirs of disease in your facility. Uh, and then I mentioned this at the beginning, uh, rodenticides and insecticides, we usually think of these sorts of things as cosmetic or convenience issues. We don't like having mice or rats on our facility, and we don't like having mosquitoes or flies. Um, these are not just uh, convenience sorts of issues. These are biosecurity decisions that you're making. So you want to make sure that you are instituting rodent control and insect control on every facility uh, to make sure that you aren't having disease transmission issues associated with those sorts of pests. Uh, Compliance is the big one here though. Uh, just like we're talking about with COVID right now with social distancing, it only works if everybody plays the same game. Uh, if you have one person in a facility who is not following the biosecurity plan, then the entire biosecurity plan is destined for failure. So you need to make sure that you have everybody trained and you have your biosecurity officer doing periodic checks to make sure that there is full compliance with biosecurity. And if you see somebody not complying with biosecurity, you need to make sure they understand the implications of it uh, and make sure that they understand that being part of your facility means they are employing all of those biosecurity steps. And if they don't want to do it, then they aren't necessarily welcome in your facility. Uh, you need to really make sure that everybody is instituting or is following all of the biosecurity measures appropriately at every time. So when we think about all of this kind of put together, uh, we're gonna put together a biosecurity plan. Uh, and every facility is unique and every facility will have its own biosecurity plan. Uh, this is a great place to involve your veterinarian in a discussion on what are the appropriate steps for your facility uh, and start to form a biosecurity plan. So when we start a biosecurity plan, the first thing we're going to do is identify risks. Uh, where do we see disease entering our facility? How is disease going to spread within the facility? Uh, and where will disease hide in your facility? What are the sorts of reservoirs in your facility? Um, once we've identified those risk factors, uh, then we need to decide what we're going to do about them. So we're going to think about the behavioral changes we're going to make. Um, decreased travel from one area to another, visitor control for uh, bio-exclusion, um, uh, making sure that we're actually doing some sort of hand sanitization after contact events. Um, we also think about what tools we're going to employ. And we talked about cleaners and disinfectants as tools that are, we're using in biosecurity, but personal protective equipment also count as uh, tools that we're going to use. Personal protective equipment is the fancy term for uh, gloves, booties, and um, face masks. So uh, do we need to use those tools based on the current risks of our facility? 
how often are you going to use those tools? So are you going to disinfect uh, daily or weekly or after every potential contact? Uh, that sort of decision comes down to how often that surface is going to be touched and how often that surface is going to be contacted by multiple individuals or multiple animals. Uh, so shared tack should be disinfected after every contact. Uh, high touch surfaces like tools um, or uh, cleaning tools, cleaning equipment, uh, doorknobs, sink handles, those should be disinfected daily. Uh, but low contact surfaces like uh, rafter beams, you know, disinfecting those periodically on a, a weekly or monthly basis as is practical may be more appropriate for your facility. Uh, and then where are you going to employ these measures? Are you going to use bio-exclusion measures to keep disease out as much as possible? Uh, do you need to put additional zones of control inside of a facility because of varying health risks? Um, you decide that based on the risks that you've identified. And then you're going to go to execution. Training is the big one here. Make, making sure that everybody is aware of the biosecurity decisions and the biosecurity plan uh, to make sure that they're applied consistently and uniformly by your entire staff is really important here. Uh, this is where compliance charts come in, making sure that if you have uh, uh, a step that is supposed to be performed by somebody every day that they also have a checklist that they uh, check and verify that they performed that biosecurity step. Um, you can then use those compliance charts when you move on to the review phase to make sure things are being performed correctly. Uh, and in that review phase, then we're going to think about records. Uh, you can review your biosecurity plan by looking back at the health records for the last year or the last month. Uh, how many animals got sick? How many animals got sick the year before? Um, are there trends there that you can notice that suggest that your biosecurity plan is working or not working? Um, also a compliance review. You can have spot checks to make sure people are performing your biosecurity plan correctly. Uh, or look at compliance charts to make sure that they're always being filled out and the checks are all there. Um, were there any specific disease outbreaks that occurred during that year uh, or month or quarter, whatever is appropriate for your facility? Uh, and is that because of new risks that uh, you failed to identify or is it because of failure of the biosecurity plan? Uh, and then also looking at the business impacts, right? Did you meet your business goals as a result of this biosecurity plan? Uh, or is the biosecurity plan that you enacted actually limiting your ability to be successful in business? Uh, and you need to decide whether or not you need to reassess risks or um, change the measures that you're employing in response to those risks. Uh, and then you'll notice down in the bottom here, I have an arrow going back to identify. So this is always a cycle. We don't just make one biosecurity plan and then never think about it again. We wanna make sure that we're always uh, executing on a biosecurity plan and reviewing to make sure it's working the way we want it to work, um, identifying new risks as they may show up. So if you become aware of a big disease outbreak, that's a new risk and you may have to institute new controls. Um, so always be executing and reviewing to make sure that you don't have sort of a, a stale plan that isn't necessarily meeting the needs of your facility. So um, hopefully I've uh, gone through most of the basics of a biosecurity plan. Uh, this is probably something you could teach a semester class on, not just a, a 30 minute lecture. So I'm sure there'll be some con, uh, or conversation related to this topic now, but um, I wanted to include my email address here. If you have any questions, feel free to pass them along after uh, we're done here. I'd be happy to uh, address any of your biosecurity concerns. Looks like Jenny's popping back on. Hello. Thanks so much um, for that wonderful information. It was really informative. Um, there's been a couple questions that have come through and I tried to organize them kind of in the flow of what your presentation was. Okay. Um, but the first was, could you describe if COVID-19 is considered an envelope virus? Um, and besides bleach uh, and maybe some specific examples of the quats type disinfectants that would be good mm -hmm. for people to identify. 
Sure. Okay, yeah, COVID is an enveloped virus. So enveloped virus simply means that it has a, uh, a, a lipid envelope around it, a little membrane basically surrounding the viral particle. Uh, and the good news about enveloped viruses is that they're very, very easy to disinfect. Uh, anything you do that disrupts that envelope um, uh, disinfects the virus. I, and I, I keep not using the word kills the virus, even though a lot of people use that. Um, biosecurity people like to get really technical about this. Viruses aren't alive, so you can't kill them. Um, so you can render them inactive. And to inactivate an enveloped virus, uh, almost all of our disinfectant chemistries will be appropriate for that. Uh, bleach does a good job on enveloped viruses, as do the quats. Uh, the phenolics, like I mentioned, Neogen's version is biofeen too, um, are generally effective against enveloped viruses. Uh, COVID-19 is specifically, or I should say SARS and COV-2, um, is specifically uh, covered right now under the EPA guidance on emerging pathogens. And for the EPA to consider a disinfectant active against uh, COVID-19's virus, you have to have emerging pathogens uh, claims on the label. Uh, and, and there is a list, you can actually search for the end list um, by the EPA. Uh, the end list will contain a, a comprehensive list of every currently approved uh, disinfectant for use against COVID-19. So uh, the, the Neogen products that I mentioned, Companion, um, we have a, one called Parvasol that is also uh, uh, effective against it. And then uh, uh, 904 would be another product. Uh, but anything on that end list is going to be appropriate for use against COVID-19. Great, thank you. And as we continue with our Q&A um, portion, please make sure that you complete the open poll. I see some of you have, have started to do that as well. So make sure to log your responses there um, as we move through the rest of the questions. Um, the second set, and we had a few that were submitted similar to this, um, but is there a good dilution chart that you have to share with regarding um, bleach for halters and other leather items? And are there other things that you could recommend that wouldn't damage the leather that would still be um, effective to use? Yeah, le leather's a tough one, again, because it is a porous surface. Uh, and so really any disinfectant uh, isn't going to have published data or, uh, or reviewed data by the EPA that says it will be an effective halter disinfectant. Um, in general, uh, 1 to 10 is the recommendation for dilution by bleach, um, but there are other uh, agents where 1 to 30 is appropriate. Um, and any other disinfectant that you buy is going to have a specific dilution listed on it uh, that is appropriate for application. So all of them will say on their uh, on their bottle that it's a, to be applied at a half ounce per gallon or two ounces per gallon. Um, the thing to think about for halters is um, what sort of chemistry you're looking at. And again, those, uh, the oxidatives and the, the halogens like bleach uh, can be a little damaging to leather over time. Uh, I think you're okay to use bleach on leather. You just have to make sure you're conditioning it afterwards. Uh, and that's probably true of almost every disinfectant. Um, it, you know, the, the downside to uh, the horse world, again, is we just don't use things that are ready for uh, easy disinfection. So, uh, and honestly, every disinfectant that's going to be mixed with water has the potential to be somewhat damaging uh, to a halter specifically over time. So making sure that you're doing some sort of conditioning step after your disinfection is accomplished, but doing it safely and appropriately and, and not having uh, contact with uh, potentially dirty surfaces before you go back and do your disinfect or your uh, conditioning step is obviously important there too. Thank you. Um, again, a lot of very similar questions coming in, um, but could you elaborate a bit more on a biosecurity plan, even a template or just some additional recommendations, especially for those that are managing either county or state level events um, that they could maybe implement or be able to share with others uh, within their programs to be able to implement um, to help keep people safe as we re-enter more common activities? 
Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of good resources on the, on the web, actually. Um, the EDCC, uh, the Equine Disease Communication Center, is a great resource for that. Um, that has some good general biosecurity tips, and I, I believe they even have a specific biosecurity for events. Um, uh, you know, in general, all of those things, as you're forming a biosecurity plan that I talked about, you just need to think about each of those steps. Bio-exclusion, bio-management, bio-containment. How do I keep disease out? Um, and, and most events are familiar with the mandated bio-exclusion things. Um, health records, um, you know, a Coggins form is a, an example of a bio-exclusion measure. Um, where they usually have difficulty is in the bio-management. Um, and really the fundamentals of biomanagement are, are going to be limiting contact, uh, limiting travel, limiting um, traffic patterns. And, and you already see those principles being applied in grocery stores around the country, right? Um, they're trying to limit the number of people who are entering. They're trying to make sure they're all traveling in one direction so you don't have multiple contacts. Um, and they're trying to maintain spacing. Uh, and the, those same principles need to be thought of at, um, at equine events. And I think what's new to us is the idea of trying to uh, limit human interaction, right? We, we were generally pretty good about making sure the horses on the facility stayed healthy. Uh, what's new to us is thinking about the fact that we also have a responsibility now of making sure that uh, there's no person-to-person -person spread of disease as well. That's not something we're used to really addressing in the, um, in the equine world. And I would say for that, the template is kind of already being laid out again by uh, businesses that have mandated contact right now. It's maintaining those social distancing and maintaining uh, specific travel patterns within the facility. Along that, um, are there any other additional recommendations that you can provide with regard to a, a human disease model to establish good biocontainment either within a facility or within different areas? Yeah, you know, uh, PPE and hand sanitation are going to be the big ones right now for containment. Um, you know, the, the whole idea of wearing face masks is a big one right now. There's a lot of discussion on, uh, on that. Uh, remember that the face masks are there to prevent somebody from spreading disease more than they are to make sure that somebody doesn't contract disease on their own. Um, and then the same with hand sanitization. It's to make sure that that person isn't spreading. Um, the the difficulty in COVID specifically right now and in managing a lot of other diseases is the presence of asymptomatic shedders. So people who don't know they're sick who are successfully spreading disease. Um, and that's where you really need to have uh, good control mechanisms related to use of hand sanitization. Um, foot baths, again, uh, are, are pretty important in the equine world as you go from one zone to another. Uh, and use of the of face masks, especially in the early period as we envision a few months out uh, uh, as we start to look at uh, getting back to business. Um, and, and enforcing that people are using them correctly. I, I can't tell you how many people I've already seen who are wearing face masks that don't cover their noses. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good if you have the mask uh, pulled down halfway to your chin because it's uncomfortable to wear over your nose. Um, so it, enforcement is probably the biggest thing that I think facilities will have to address. Uh, how do you make sure that everybody is following the biosecurity rules for your facility? Um, and, and what sort of measures do you have in place? Are, are you going to uh, exclude somebody from the facility? Are you going to ban them? How many warnings do they get? Uh, these all become challenges for uh, facilities managers now as we look at uh, trying to get back to business in the future. Absolutely, and as we uh, continue the Q&A, would you mind to just shift to the next slide so we can see the... Um... Absolutely, sorry. Perfect, thank you. Um, so along those lines um, of you know, trying to maintain personal protective measures, um, are there any things that people can do in addition for those that are maybe not able to follow social distancing guidelines? So for example, maybe a farm manager who's having to hold horses for the farrier or for the veterinarian that can't 
um, you know, stay within that six feet recommendation. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, a lot of veterinarians have actually gone to uh, bringing their own help with them and even asking people to stay in a, uh, in their house and not come out uh, uh, to hold horses for them. Uh, but yeah, anytime you are forced into a potential risk event, um, which, you know, being closer than social distancing, and, and I, I realize the reality of the world is that uh, uh, as we still have to care for our horses, we don't always have the option of uh, limiting contact. Uh, but that's where you really want to make sure you're using every available tool, uh, the face mask, gloves, uh, this dedicated footwear that is unique to that barn or a disposable booty. I personally don't like using disposable booties around horses. I find them a little difficult to walk in and a little slippery uh, and that poses its own safety risk. I know it's, it's uh, not a lot of good if you've uh, uh, avoided COVID, but then I had to go to the hospital for a broken leg. Um, so I, you know, making sure that you're using all of those tools, use a foot bath, um, I haven't really talked about foot baths too much, but making sure that that foot bath is appropriately maintained. Uh, that means that it has to be changed regularly, uh, usually daily. Um, so you only mix up enough solution that you're going to use for the day uh, and then make sure that that boot bath is uh, discarded at the end of the day and replaced with fresh solution. Um, making sure you're using a change of clothes and then making sure you're using all the appropriate PPE, including a face mask. Uh, if you're having to violate those rules of social distance right now, uh, those are your, your best bets. Great. And as far as setting up a foot bath or a hand wash station, um, you know, is it best to, to direct traffic into and out of the barn or, or each area specifically that way people have to go past those? Or could you provide a little more um, ideas for people on how to set this up on their facilities? Yeah, I mean, the ideal for any facility would be a unique uh, entry and exit. Um, so if you had one door that everybody's supposed to come in and one door that everybody's supposed to leave, that would be ideal. Not everybody has that uh, capability. Um, and I'm a big believer in ventilation too. So I, I certainly don't want people to have, you know, doors shut everywhere to only allow people in one side. Uh, but that's where some visible signage to make sure that people know you do not enter this door. You have to go in by the foot bath um, is, is probably a good measure to make sure people are doing that. And again, that's kind of where the training and the biosecurity officer comes into play is to uh, make sure that if they see people trying to enter in the wrong place or if staff sees people entering the wrong place that they're told they can't do it uh, and that they enforce that every time, right? Um, you just need to train all of the people in your facility that there is a specific way to get in and a specific way to get out. Um, again, not always practical and I recognize that and it's kind of I've tried to not be real specific in measures and say you have to do this because really every facility needs to identify what the appropriate steps are um, unique to the risks of that facility uh, on its own. Um, if you are having people come in and out, it is okay to use the same foot bath for in and out traffic. Um, you just want to make sure that you're limiting contact at that point. You know, that becomes a pinch point where somebody trying to enter and somebody trying to exit are going to be in close contact. Uh, so you want to come up with some form of measure to make sure that uh, uh, there's still distance employed there and you aren't having people trying to stand side by side pushing their way through a foot bath. That's really good information. Um, it looks like the last question we have are that there are a few um, articles out there highlighting that rubbing alcohol or isopropyl alcohol is a good option as a disinfectant to use on leather. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that people should use and could you provide any additional recommendations regarding isopropyl alcohol? Yeah, alcohols are good disinfectants um, for certain applications. Um, remember, alcohol is the component of hand sanitizers that are uh, being recommended. Uh, and they only really work, though, in that fairly high concentration, somewhere between 60 to 90 percent, depending on the specific alcohol. Um, so they are good. Um, a couple things to remember though is that they need to be applied uh, so that they stay wet through the contact time, which is usually around 30 seconds uh, to a minute for, um, 
for alcohols. And so you can't just take a little bit of alcohol on a, um, on a towel and wipe stuff down and expect that you're accomplishing disinfection with it. You have to apply a, a fair bit of uh, alcohol to a surface to actually have the desired effect. Uh, that being said, just like the other disinfectants, um, it's, it's a good tool to use, but you are going to have some uh, potentially damaging effect on leather. Alcohol is actually really good for most other things like nylon and other surfaces that we encounter in equine world. So, um, yeah, if you can get a hold of isopropyl alcohol right now, it's certainly a reasonable tool. Um, and so we had a question relative to the tack disinfectant of once the disinfection is completed, um, mm -hmm. then going back and oiling or something like that um, doesn't negate the disinfectant, correct? But that it doesn't necessarily prevent from that piece of equipment from getting contaminated in the future. Yeah, so it, it, disinfection is never a, uh, a one-time thing and it's, it's good forever. Um, a, a disinfection is always only as good as the next contact it has with a pathogen. So uh, yeah, as you disinfect tack in particular, um, if you go back and do a conditioning step, I, like I said, you want to be really careful about how you're doing that. You, you don't want to have a process where you're disinfecting dirty tack and then while it's drying, you're over here uh, trying to recondition some that you just disinfected and then you go back to the other stuff. It should be uh, everything is disinfected left alone for the contact time, uh, which for some disinfectants might be up to 10 minutes. Uh, then you can return back with clean hands, clean tools, um, and do some sort of conditioning step. Great. And we had one that was submitted earlier that I didn't want to forget. Um, along the PPE, the face mask recommendation that you mentioned, um, including cloth, are there different types of cloth that are better to use to help stay, people stay protected? Um, and then how deep should that foot bath actually be? Yeah, so the foot bath I'll tackle first. The foot bath should be as deep as the tread on uh, any boots that you're wearing. Um, you want to make sure that it's actually getting all of the potentially dirty surface of your boots. Um, and, uh, you know, some boot baths can be fairly irritating to uh, shoe material. So, you know, rubber boots work best. Uh, boot baths can be a little irritating to leather boots uh, also. Uh, so you do want to be aware of that, uh, that you aren't just making them 12 inches deep and trying to, you know, soak your feet in them as you go through. It really is just meant to get the soles clean. Um, in terms of masks, uh, I haven't seen anything to specify which particular material is there. With masks, the big secret is about plies. Uh, and you should have multiple folds and multiple pleats on it. Um, so you're better with multiple layers of material than you are with a single layer of any one material. Uh, so you want to make sure when you're uh, constructing any of these masks that you're using a um, uh, a relatively fine weave material. You don't obviously want big gaps in it uh, and having multiple um, multiple layers there. And then the pleating on the masks, uh, if you've seen some of those designs, is there to make sure that you can uh, fully pull it and cover your entire face with a good tight fit. Uh, if you have, if you haven't incorporated pleats into it, you'll end up with gaps on the sides after you loop it over your ears or you tie it. Um, and when you cough, uh, all the air just goes out the sides where the gaps are and you've efficiently spread disease. So, um, you know, really any, any good material that's uh, fine weave and in multiple layers is going to be uh, uh, better than walking around with no mask, which is the alternative most people have right now. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lyman. We really appreciate you being here. Um, for those that are still on, if you could finish up the poll, if you haven't completed it already. Um, and we are excited that we have another upcoming webinar on April 23rd, um, <clears throat> talking about boarding contracts and some um, legal considerations for equine facilities. And so the link that's included here below, um, there is a pre-registration required for this webinar, so make sure that you visit 
Um, we've also got it posted at the Extension Horses Facebook page um, and some other places throughout each of your state extension specialists. So uh, make sure that you tune into that one. And again, thanks Dr. Lyman. We can kind of give you a virtual round of applause. I mean, really appreciate your time and um, sharing all that great information with us today. Yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. And we just had one quick question um, come in about the um, slides and the recordings. So we will be posting um, the recordings at a variety of different locations, both within the Extension Horses um, website, which is extensionhorses.org, um, on the Facebook page, and then also throughout our social media presences in each state. So um, check that information out and you'll be able to access that hopefully within the next day. Thanks so much. I think that went well. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, we'll see what sort of questions we get emailed to me afterwards. Jenny, did you stop the recording?